So oh. let's change uh, track and go to Axios. And who better to tell us about how uh, the idea of Axios came about and how the Axios tent was developed than Kenneth Bin Moller himself. Ken, um, we are privileged to have you here. Um, please continue. Uh, first, really, Vinny, uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to contribute to this. I think this is uh, in an in inaugural, a premiere in terms of a seminar dedicated to EUS uh, stents, uh, stents that are specifically designed for EUS interventions. And I think that has been such a major breakthrough uh, that we have uh, seen over this past decade. And so uh, we're, uh, go of course, going to see so many uh, new and future uh, breakthroughs in this space. Um, but I feel very privileged to uh, be part of the momentum uh, of this new frontier. So my thanks for the uh, invitation. And I'm going to actually take you on a, maybe a, a personal journey here in terms of the idea of the lambs uh, and uh, how it was developed and uh, comment on future directions. Okay, let's see. I, uh, there we go. Um, you know, our partnership with industry is so critical for the advancement uh, of our specialty, uh, interventional endoscopy. Uh, but it's important that, of course, we are always transparent about conflicts of interest. So I, I am a proud parent uh, of Axios, and uh, Boston Scientific became the adoptive parent for uh, Axios uh, after Exlumina handed it over to them. Uh, but I don't have any royalty or equity stake in Axios. So I just want to be clear that uh, I'm, I'm entirely neutral and uh, I am uh, interested solely as a practitioner to see our field uh, advance, no matter who we work in partnership with. Um, much of my talk is in uh, a chapter that I wrote uh, or a contribution that I made uh, for an inaugural issue of Techniques and Innovations in Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. It's a journal of the AGA, and Anthony Teo invited me to contribute uh, this first inaugural uh, issue chapter, and uh, Anthony is the uh, co-editor for this uh, first issue. So the title of this paper is Design Considerations of the Axial Stent and Electrocautery Enhanced Delivery System. So if you're interested, feel free to look at this article, which captures uh, much of what you're, you will hear about in my presentation. So I've been really blessed to have personally witnessed the evolution of EUS starting as a pure imaging modality uh, with using the radial scanning echo endoscope. That's how I started doing EUS when I joined NIPSA Henders unit in 1991. And it evolved very quickly to an interventional uh, modality with the ability to do FNA. And the therapy, our ability to do EUS guided therapeutic interventions, that's of course where all the excitement is. And of course, this is thanks to the development of the linear array echo endoscope. So therapy started uh, for me, because uh, I think of FNA really as still an extension of diagnosis. So therapy started in Hamburg in 1992. We had a patient with a non-bulging pseudocyst. We were draining pseudocysts endoscopically, but uh, we could only drain the bulging pseudocyst. And we had a patient with a non-bulging pseudocyst, and we started thinking outside the box in terms of how we might be able to drain this pseudocyst under US guidance. And we fortunately had one of the very first prototypes of the Pentax echo endoscope the CLA echo endoscope with a 2.0 millimeter channel. So we punctured this uh, pseudocyst with a uh, home fashioned uh, device really, and we passed a wire uh, through it. Uh, we needed cautery to get into the pseudocyst, and then we did an over the wire exchange for the 4.2 millimeter duodenoscope. And from here, it's basically like ERCP. We dilated the tract, and then we placed a 10 French pigtail stent. And so that was, the first report of EOS guided drainage of a pancreatic uh, pseudocyst in 1992, published in GIE. So we adopted from our radiology colleagues 
the Sodinger technique. It's the over the wire technique. And uh, you're all familiar with this because this is how we had been draining pseudocysts uh, historically. We access the cyst with an FNA needle. We insert a wire into the cyst, allow it to coil a few times. Now we have a platform to railroad our coaxial instruments over the guide wire. We dilate the track, we can use a balloon, we can use a bougie, and then we drain the cysts with one or more plastic stents. But we soon realized that we endoscopists encountered challenges that our radiology colleagues really did not face to the same degree at least, because we're working from a much further distance from our target. So we were performing multiple over the wire device exchanges and in that process we could lose access to our wire. And this was very tedious and time consuming working over this long distance. But more importantly, there was always a step off between the guide wire and the catheter device. And this step off created difficulties for us to traverse the wall, the bowel wall, and get into the target lumen, especially when that wall was fibrotic as it is, for example, for a, a pseudocyst. And we realized that the Sondinger technique, as elegant and uh, revolutionary as it was, it is a multi-step technique in which with each of these steps, we take a, 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 a risk. And that risk uh, starts with um, the removal of our needle, leaving our guide wire in place. Because when we remove that needle, leaving the guide wire, we now have a gap between the guide wire and our tract. And this is where the leak actually starts, just with the removal of our FNA needle. When we dilate our tract to enable insertion of our stamp later, we can displace our target uh, lumen if it's not firmly adherent to the bowel wall. And this dilation itself can result even in perforation, into frank perforation. When we remove our dilator, again, we have that gap between the guide wire and our dilator resulting in leak. And even when we place our stent, if it's not an adherent target lumen, we can displace that lumen uh, away. And without question, the greatest fear was that we would cause perforation, frank perforation with leakage of intestinal contents into the peritoneal space. We also realize that there are many technical challenges using our conventional tubular stents for transluminal drainage. So these tubular stents have a tubular configuration. After all, they are designed for lumen recanalization. There's no lumen to lumen apposition. The ends project into both of the lumens. When we use plastic stents, the double pigtail stents, these have a small fixed diameter, so there can be leak around the stent itself. There is that gap between the stent and the tract diameter. If we place multiple stents, we have to place multiple guide wires, and this entails multiple steps. When we use metal stents, we address the problem of reducing the risk of leak with the covered SEMS, but we then realized we have the risk of maldeployment and migration because these metal stents are tubular in configuration. Perhaps just totally captured in our enthusiasm that we could go through the bowel wall and we could access extra intestinal uh, structures, we didn't fully realize that every time we do a transluminal intervention, we are creating an intentional perforation. So we get away with that with impunity when that target lesion is adherent to the bowel wall. But if it's not adherent, so for example the gallbladder here, and you can see this echogenic layer interposed between the gallbladder and the bowel lumen, the duodenum, this gallbladder is not adherent. This is fat tissue between these two lumen structures. And when the patient goes to surgery, we again see that open space between the two lumens of the gallbladder 
and the duodenum. So what we have lacked are the tools dedicated for transluminal therapy, because all of our innovation has been in the lumen, and now we're thinking outside the lumen or through the wall with EUS guidance. We were this plumber here who is using his finger to plug the hole in the bathtub, and his wrench in the back pocket here isn't gonna do a lot. And um, I was perhaps this child here who is asking, where are your tools? Because we need tools to prevent that risk of leak and perforation that sometimes could be even fatal. So we needed, in my opinion, two tools. Firstly, we needed a transluminal stent, what we today call a LAMS. It needs to be covered and self-expanding to seal off the tract. It should be lumen opposing, and it should provide a port for transluminal intervention. This port for transluminal, transluminal intervention is so critical if we truly want to extend the reach of the endoscopist to the extraintestinal space. But we also need a transluminal stent delivery system that is designed to eliminate Seldinger, to eliminate over the guide wire exchange. We need to be able to access the target lumen with a stent loaded uh, catheter. So here you can see some diagrams of some of the uh, concepts uh, which I uh, patented very uh, early on as I thought about ways that we can accomplish safer and, and uh, more efficient transluminal therapy. So the LAMS concept uh, was filed in 2008. This is from the abstract, a device whereby two luminal structures in the body may be drawn toward each other and a fluid conduit formed in between. Here you can see one of the embodiments that I came up with. It looks different from the Axios, of course, but the concept is shown here how the two flanges are pulling the walls of these two lumens in at position and holding them together. So this evolved to the Axios lambs with four key features. It, it consists of a self-expanding nitinal mesh. It has anchoring double-walled flanges. It has a very short one centimeter saddle that's designed to traverse just the two walls, and it has full silicon uh, coating. Now, a parent, of course, spends a lot of time thinking about a great name for its, uh, its newborn. So I thought a long time about a name that captures the spirit and the essence of the lambs. So I came up with the name Axios, which captures two things. First of all, it's, it's axial introduction, which is how we work endoscopically, and it is creating an anastomosis, an ostomy. So we are creating a transluminal anastomosis. Axial ostomy, os is opening, so that we can also go through this os into the extraintestinal space, axios. And it so happens that Axios is also the name of a famous Greek god called Axios, and it is in Greek mythology, the river god. How befitting for the name of a device that enables the flow of contents from an extraintestinal structure like a pseudocyst or the gallbladder into the bowel lumen. So in 2008, uh, I founded uh, Ex Lumina. Uh, that many of you in the audience probably uh, worked with or, or know of. Um, so it started uh, just a few miles away from my hospital here in San Francisco with a mission to develop tools for EOS-guided uh, intervention. We needed these tools and to go beyond, to go beyond into the extraintestinal space with advanced transluminal uh, therapy. X outside the lumen, X lumina. And uh, this is how I started. Uh, we, I brought on a CEO uh, to basically get the funding for the company. Um, and this is Michael Allen. And uh, these are some of our engineers, brilliant. Here is Tom DeSimio. Many of you have worked with Tom. Tom was my sidekick nurse at California Pacific for uh, many years. 
and uh, I was able to recruit him to become the trainer and my sidekick working as the CMO at Xlumina. So when you develop a new device, and I learned all of this by osmosis really, by doing, uh, there are basically four med tech stages. So the first stage is proof of concept. This is the design and development of your concept. And it starts with benchtop prototyping and simulation on the benchtop. Then once you have that checked off, you go to the animal study. So you wanna use live tissue. After you have your final design, so the design is quote frozen, so it's locked down, you go to what's called VNV. So VNV is verification and validation. So this is actually quite an arduous process because this is the requirement for submission to regulatory, to the FDA, for example. So verification focuses on the product itself. So you go back and you do more benchtop studies to verify. The validation is far more expensive. That's where we're focused on the user, the operator who is using the Axios device. These are our clinical studies. Then you submit to regulatory, the FDA, uh, to get your clearance um, or your approval, depending on whether it's a 510K or it's a PMA. Now they have something called a 510K de novo, that's what Axios was, which is a grant. Uh, the CE mark is the other regulatory agency that you know about. And finally then, when the FDA and the CE gives you the green light, you can move to the commercial launch. And that commercial launch, by the way, obligates the company to follow the outcomes for six to 12 months afterwards. So you do a post-market survey and registry to confirm that your device indeed is doing what it's intended to do, but most, most importantly, that it's safe. So bench type prototyping is without question the most arduous. Here you can see what we set up for our bench top uh, work here. So we worked in this room exclusively um, over many, many months. And here were our goals and our solutions for our lamps. We want lumen position, but we don't want that to be so excessive that it results in ischemia. We want to avoid ischemia. The solution was a large flange surface area. We want this lambs to resist migration, but we also want it to be removable. The solution was a double walled flange construction. It needs to be compressible for axial introduction, but after its deployment, when we pull out back the sheath, it needs to resume its intended original shape, the lamb shape. So it has to resume that shape fully after deployment. So we found out this needs a 48 night no wire braid. And finally, we needed coating that is uniform and is durable, and yet it needs to be thin and flexible and conforming. So to find that sweet spot is really no easy task. And we tried many different methods how to coat the lambs. You can use dipping methods, uh, you can do, as you can see here, manual brushing onto the lambs itself. And we found that the manual brushing uh, worked best. And we found that silicon was the best material for the lambs. So just to give you an example, looking for the optimal flange design, it goes through many, many stages until you come up with that flange design that works. So here you can see one of the very first embodiments or designs. And actually these are two halves that are uh, merged together, that are joined together in the middle here. You can see there's no lip here with the advantage that you don't have anything projecting out. But this really did not have the pullout force that we wanted. So this got modified to adding this lip uh, component here. But now we are increasing the length and these ends may project into the lumen and may cause tissue trauma. So then we had to coat this with a special coating to protect it, these uh, bare wire ends from injury. So just an example of the stages that one goes through until you actually find the optimal design, 
which is double walled. It, the flanges are 90 degrees to the saddle, and the flanges need to be twice the lumen diameter. They have to have a very large surface and a construction that evenly distributes the pressure over that surface area. And it then needs to have that lip, which you see here, to optimize the pullout uh, force. Now, you go to simulation next with benchtop models, and our engineers constructed such a simulator. You can see two frames. These two frames are mobile against each other uh, to simulate the bowel wall and an extra intestinal wall, which is non-adherent. So these slide against each other. And then we have a membrane here, it's silicon, that simulates tissue. So it would be the gallbladder wall, for example, or the bowel wall. So here you can see in this video, quickly how we're able to penetrate through that first wall and enter through the second wall, deliver the distal flange, snug it up against that distal wall. We can see how it pulls that mobile uh, frame up uh, uh, against the first frame, and then we can deploy this and we can pass an endoscope through it. So once we have determined that this works in a benchtop simulator, we can go to the animal studies, of course, with a rigorously designed uh, protocol. And uh, you can see here the gallbladder of the pig, and we're introducing our labs. You can see the distal flange here. You're all familiar with these types of images now. We can pass our scope through the lambs without displacing it. We can go into the gallbladder. We can visualize the interior of the gallbladder. I was seeing the interior of the gallbladder for the first time in my life, so you can imagine how exciting it was to do this for the first time. And we then followed the lambs after implant over many, many weeks, showing that there was no injury to the wall, no inflammation, no necroses, and that the lumen remained pat patent. And then on necropsy afterwards, in these survival animals, you can see the, uh, the, the, the two ends. And then this was published in 2011, um, uh, basically validating the uh, animal results. The verification testing is where you focus on the product specs, and the question is, did you design the product right? So it's all about the product itself. You test the biomechanics, what's the pullout strength, what's the radial strength, does it do what it's intended to do, and you want to test biocompatibility to make sure that it won't get rejected. All the materials are biocompatible. And just as an example, this is a tensimeter. This tensimeter is used to measure the pullout st strength, so the anti-migration strength, and it showed that the axial stent had 5-4 greater pullout strength compared to the wall stent. So that's, you have to always use something that exists in the commercial space to compare it to. The radial uh, strength was less, so that was the compromise at the expense of radial strength. Strength The wall stand had twofold the radial st uh, strength, which is one reason why we recommended that you balloon dilate the lumen after placing the stent if you want to get more rapid drainage. Sterilization and shelf life is also part of the verification testing. So you have to show that your packaging is meets all of the regulatory requirements. The validation testing then follows. This is about the user interface. Did you design the right product? It's not about the, was the product done right? Now it's about, is it the right product for the user? So it starts with the indications for use, the instructions for use and the labeling, the physician training requirements. The physician must understand what the indications and contraindications are and all the warnings on its use step by step. Then you go to the clinical studies. You have to define the requirements. Then you can do the first in man. And finally, you do a registry study, which is multi-center to document safety and efficacy. And very quickly, the first in man, we are very fortunate to be able to team up with Takao and in, uh, at his center in Tokyo, 20 patients, 10 pseudocysts, five gallbladders. Of course, a testimony to Takao's skill, 100% technical and clinical success, 
transluminal interventions in seven of these uh, uh, patients without complications, stents removed without complications. So this is really the clinical proof of concept now, and then follows the registry. So this is the really expensive part to do the registry study, multi-center, and we, had, we enrolled 33 patients, seven centers, six in the US, one in Europe, 22 months um, uh, follow-up, and technical success rate was 91%. Clinical success also very high complications here. So all of this was reported then. Uh, Raj Shah took the lead in the publication. My name is not on there uh, because of conflict of interest. Um, this led to the FDA clearance in 2014. So this was the, uh, the breakthrough in terms of becoming available for use in the United States. So we talked about the LAMS. But equally important is the transluminal delivery system, obviously less critical if you have an adherent target organ, but for something like the gallbladder, very critical. And this should be a system that is one step, one single device, and fully exchange free. In other words, we are eliminating cell injury. We access the target lumen with the device loaded catheter, and we immediately deploy the device without any guide wire exchange. So an exchange-free delivery system, as elegant uh, as it sounds, is very challenging. Um, we can use bougies, but we know that it may push the wall, the target lumen away, because it's hard to penetrate through the wall. We may displace the target balloon. Same problem with wall penetration. We can get perforation and bleeding when we dilate. We can use a blade and we can incise, but we risk bleeding. And we can use electrocautery. We often have to resort to electrocautery when the above doesn't work. But we burn a hole in the wall, and that's an unforgiving hole. It's not going to close spontaneously. Um, and there is the collateral thermal uh, injury. So these are all of the challenges that one faces. So I came up with different concepts. At first, I thought it needs to be a multi layered uh, system whereby we have to create counter traction to make sure we don't push our target lumen uh, away. So I came up with uh, this concept of the dog bone balloon. So you can see the first step is the FNA puncture, and then we can, pay, uh, we can then over that FNA needle, we can advance our balloon. Now this balloon, you'll see when it dilates, it takes on a dog bone configuration. That's the configuration that we're going to use when we deploy our stent, which comes as our third layer. So this is a three layer system. So now the third layer is just a tubular stent, but the balloon gives it that dog bone configuration. So this was you know, one, one way that this could be done. And you can see its resemblance to Axios. Now this is another concept that I had which is a two-layered system using a switch blade to gain entry. You can see that this blade flips up as soon as the trocar advances outside of the sheet. Some of you who use Navix may be familiar with this because this was the platform for that. But you can see in this cartoon how this is performed. The echoendoscope now is positioned across from the gallbladder. We see that under EOS guidance, of course. Now you can see they're not adherent. We puncture through with the switch blade um, and we create that three millimeter opening and immediately inflate a balloon and retract to create counter traction. So this is our retraction to keep that gallbladder wall snug up against the bowel wall and then we can deploy the distal flange and the proximal flange and then we can also dilate that tract. So that's another concept. This is a third concept called the cutter dilator uh, we were very excited about this at one time. You see the needle. You can see we used a different kind of anchor, which is a cage that opens up like this, four-pronged cage. Here's a cutter dilator blade that can be activated to make a cut and incision for the desired diameter to deploy your axial stent. So here you can see the cage, the cutter wire here after it's advanced, it's activated. Then we pull back the cage. It engages into the little slots keeping our, our wall hugged up in that position with the bow wall and then axials. So these are all the concepts. But where it finally ended after you know, countless months, 
really it was years of trial and error is the electoral cautery enhanced delivery system, what we call hot axios. Now we had of course tried cystotomes in the animal lab. The problem was the extensive thermal injury, the collateral damage, and that I didn't like, but our engineers came up with this concept of incorporating micro wires just along the edge. These are radially opposed and they converge towards the tip. There's another micro wire at the very tip where the guide wire can come out. So you're all familiar with this. This is a ceramic bougie tip to give it the force, the uh, solidity to uh, optimize your forward advancement, your trackability of your uh, device as you penetrate through. So we're minimizing the cautery effect, um, and we are maximizing the cutting effect. So really this works really like a, a blade, um, uh, like a knife, uh, rather than as a cautery uh, device. When you deploy a LAMS, that's one centimeter in length, obviously there is absolutely no room for error. This must be so precisely delivered. But the good news is, we are used to single operator, single hand control when we do FNA. So we're simply applying that where the, uh, the, F, the handle lure locks uh, as we uh, are used to, and then we do a two-stage release of each flange independent of one another. And that was so critical that these two stages are independent of one another, and that you verify that the distal flange is correctly deployed and hugged up against the wall of your target lumen before you deploy the proximal uh, flange. So we built in all sorts of safety measures to ensure that this is uh, delivered accurately and safely, even with adding labels and numbers one, two, three, and four to remind the endoscopist of these four really simple steps. Because of time constraints, I'm not going to go uh, show you this video because I think everyone in the audience is familiar with the four steps uh, of the LAMS uh, delivery. So the LAMS is not just about a lumen opposing metal stent to prevent leakage and perforation. More important, I think, in terms of the future direction is it's a port for endotherapy. So this has been demonstrated so beautifully by Anthony Teo and his team in Hong Kong, and they reported back in 2016 on how they could use the Axios as a port to enter into the gallbladder, and you can do really everything you can do in the lumen. And obviously you can do a lithotripsy in there under direct endoscopic guidance, and you can, it could be mechanical, it could be electrohydraulic, but you can do magnifying endoscopy, confocal, microscopy. Um, you can do EUS with mini probes. Um, really, there, there is no limit because you have extended the reach of the endoscopist into this extraintestinal structure. So the applications right now have been focused on these two extraluminal structures. First, our pancreatical biliary. We have pancreatic applications for cyst enterostomy, um, and we have gallbladder drainage, uh, cholecystoenterostomy. We have bile duct drainage, cholodocal enterostomy. You've all heard about these. What we're hearing more about, and I think is the topic of a future webinar, is are the enteric applications to create a gastroenterostomy, and in patients who have a bypass stomach, who have had a, a prior gastric bypass to create a gastro gastrostomy, the what we call the edge procedure to enable ERCP. But what's ironic is that a device that was designed for EOS guided delivery because we had no such device and we were using tubular stents off the shelf in a um, uh, in an off-label application. Now we're using Axios off-label for luminal interventions to treat pyloric stenoses and short strictures such as anastomotic uh, strictures. So I'll end with uh, future directions, and I think I'm right on time now. Um, really, it's all of you in the audience that will carry the baton, uh, carry the torch forward. Uh, this is a platform. 
it is not intended for the treatment of any specific disease or any specific function. It is a platform that can be applied throughout the gastrointestinal tract. So wherever our endoscope can go, we can apply the LAMS a platform. And as you can see in this list, pretty much every organ of the body is accessible through the GI tract. It is literally the window to all the major uh, organs. So I'm gonna leave you with two quotes um, that beautifully captures thinking outside of the box. And of course, this legendary thinker uh, is best known for thinking outside the box, who said, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. And we faced so many years of difficulty performing pseudocystrainage, I certainly did, and that inspired the development of LAMS. If you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. So that's why we have to have the courage to, to plow these new frontiers um, to create that fertile soil for uh, innovation. And we need industry uh, to do this, uh, but at the same time, we also want to always put our patients first. Thank you so much again for the opportunity to contribute. Fantastic, Ken. Uh